Hello everybody. This lesson is about intertidal ecology. The picture we're showing here is a tide chart which illustrates the tidal elevation over the course of a 24-hour period. And you can see that there are highs and low periods of the tide um, that occur twice within the 24-hour cycle. Um, and tides vary from place to place, but the general idea is that water levels go up and down some amount over 12 or 24 hours. The intertidal zone is the area of the seafloor that is sometimes covered by the ocean during high tides and is other, other times exposed to the air during the low tides. So that's the definition of the intertidal zone. And we describe and measure different locations within the intertidal zone with what we call tidal datums, which are sort of like reference points based on the average, maximum, minimum levels that, that we ever see the tide getting to at a particular spot. So one of the most important tidal datums on a tide chart is abbreviated MLLW. That stands for Mean Lower Low Water which is the typical height of the lowest low tide that occurs during a 24-hour period. So uh, usually anything below MLLW is covered by water. Um, and there are other tidal datums that are sometimes used like MSL, sometimes abbreviated MTL, is the mean tidal level or mean sea level. And that's an important measurement when we're doing things like measuring sea level rise over the long term. So the um, zone of the seabed uh, that is sometimes covered with water, sometimes not, um, we call it the intertidal zone, uh, but it's also sometimes called the littoral zone. Uh, and intertidal and littoral mean the same thing. So this is a tiny, tiny fraction of the total seabed environment. Uh, most of the surface of the earth is either above the ocean all the time or covered in water all the time. And it's just a tiny little sliver around the edge of the ocean that is the intertidal zone that's sometimes covered. And yet, despite being just a tiny little fringe of the ocean, marine intertidal environments have been uh, heavily studied and a lot of really valuable insight has come from studying the intertidal environment, particularly where the shoreline is rocky, um, which we call the rocky intertidal. There are really interesting ecosystems there that have been the focus of intense study. This picture here shows some young scientists studying the rocky intertidal environment in Maine, where these intertidal rocks are covered in a few species of seaweed. And beneath the seaweed, there are barnacles, snails, mussels, other interesting organisms. And um, they're manipulating and studying what's going on in the rocky intertidal environment, as many other scientists have done in rocky intertidal shores throughout the world. So why are scientists so focused on studying the rocky intertidal? There's a number of reasons that the rocky intertidal is an ideal environment for marine ecological study. One reason is that there are a lot of uh, environmental gradients that are compressed into a small area, sort of between the high and the low tide line, you can see a radical transition from a terrestrial environment to a fully marine environment and everything in between. And associated with that gradient, there's differences in temperature, wave exposure, all kinds of the environmental gradients that can structure the communities of life. Uh, so when we see differences in communities of life in different places or different sets of environmental conditions, we call that biological zonation. And the biological zonation in the rocky intertidal is so obvious that you can see it with um, it just at a glance at low tide, like you can see in this picture, the different zones of different organisms um, distributed along the uh, elevation of the shoreline there. Another reason it's studied is because it's easy to access. So all you have to do is wait until low tide and then you can walk out onto the seabed, um, which is great. You know, humans can't breathe underwater, so most of the ocean is difficult for us to access and study, but the intertidal zones of the world are much more accessible. 
Um, and the, many of the organisms that live on rocky intertidal shores in particular are sessile organisms, organisms that don't move. So that could be sessile animals like barnacles or mussels or marine algae, which we call seaweeds, um, that uh, also don't move. Um, because they don't move, they're easy to manipulate. You can scrape them off or glue them on. Um, you can have all kinds of interesting little manipulations to see how the organisms affect each other in the intertidal environment. And it's easy to do with these slow moving or non-moving organisms. The organism on the lower right is Pisaster ocratius, which is a type of sea star or starfish, not actually a fish, it's in, in the phylum Echinodermata, um, which was studied extensively in the Pacific Northwest coast. So because the rocky intertidal is such an ideal study system, a lot of our fundamental understanding of ecology in general, ec ecological principles that we can apply not just to the rocky intertidal, but to uh, any kind of living system, uh, a lot of those insights came from studies that were done in the rocky intertidal. And some brilliant scientists who've gone on to have uh, illustrious careers have begun their lives in the Rocky Intertidal. Uh, one such famous scientist is Dr. Jane Lubchenco, a Rocky Intertidal ecologist who published a lot of great scientific papers and because of her uh, excellence in scientific research and management she was appointed to be the first female director of the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Association, a really important federal agency in the United States. All right, so um, what are the important abiotic gradients in rocky and sandy shores? I said that there's a bunch of gradients and they're sort of uh, all compressed into a small area, um, which makes them easy to study. But, but what kind of gradients really are we talking about and, and how do they affect the uh, organisms there? I'll go through and talk about what I think are some of the most important environmental gradients that structure the life of the intertidal. Number one gradient is what we sometimes call the exposure gradient, sometimes called the elevation gradient. It just basically means how high you are on the shore, and that is of great consequence to aquatic organisms because if you're an aquatic organism, being out of the water is bad. Most aquatic organisms cannot tolerate drying out, and uh, prolonged exposure to the air will kill them like the air exposure has killed the fish in this picture here. Um, so basically the higher you are along this exposure gradient, uh, the higher you are on the shore, the closer you are to the highest high tide line, um, the more, the greater percentage of time you are exposed to the air versus being underwater. And so the stress level that you experience from all that exposure to air is, is higher. Um, so the stresses take various, of air exposure take various forms. Desiccation, which means drying out, is one stress. Extreme heat is another stress. Water temperatures don't vary as much as air temperatures. Um, and so when the rocks, uh, the rock intertidal are exposed to air, they can get as hot as the black asphalt in a parking lot and that's very difficult for an organism to tolerate. Um, the other hand, extreme cold can also occur. The ocean is never much colder than zero degrees Celsius, but um, uh, when exposed to air, rocky intertidal organisms can freeze and get much colder. Um, evaporation is a problem, not just because it dries out organisms, but because by removing water it leaves extremely salty brine behind, leading to hypersalinity, which means an excessive amount of salt. Uh, but the opposite can happen too, because organisms that are uh, exposed at low tide can be rained on, and that can put them in a freshwater environment. So not only do they have to tolerate extreme heat and cold and drying out, they also have to tolerate wide swings in salinity. So some um, factors of the environment can make the stresses of exposure worse or not as bad. And I'd like, you, you may have already guessed uh, what some of those environmental factors are that can make it um, not so bad or, or really bad to be exposed to air. So in an environment that's cool and humid and, and cloudy, it's not as bad to be exposed to the air. So someplace like the Pacific Northwest where it's foggy and misty and cool, uh, organisms in the rocky intertidal don't dry out as easily and there will be sort of uh, 
greater abundance and diversity of rock meter tidal life. Whereas if you're on a, the shores near a tropical desert where there's really intense heat and sunshine, then the stresses of evaporation and heat are extreme. Um, so you would not see as much lush life in the rocky intertidal zone. So it's not just about how high you are on the shore, but it's also about sort of the uh, climatological conditions of the environment in that area that determine the level of stress. Another gradient that's very consequential for what type of life you'll see in the rocky intertidal zone is how intense the waves and water currents are. So areas where the water is quite still and calm will have different types of rocky intertidal life than areas where they're constantly being bashed by waves. So waves bashing against the shore can rip organisms off just by the sheer force of the water. Um, they can also erode the, the shoreline uh, or bring in sediments and, and bury the organisms. And there can be tumbling rocks as well. So if you're an organism that's attached to a rock and the rock rolls over, you're going to roll around and get crushed. Uh, also, sometimes the water current itself might not be enough to rip you off the rock, but there will be small rocks or gravel that will be tossed around in the waves, and it's like you get scoured with the um, rocks that are thrown by the waves, and that's enough to bash organisms off of the rocks in high wave energy areas. So. Um, the exposure gradient, which we talked about on the last slide, was easy to understand because basically the higher you are on the shore, the more exposed to air you are for more of the time. But the wave energy gradient is a little bit different. Um, as you go from the lower intertidal zone to the upper intertidal zone, the peak wave energy is actually in the mid intertidal zone around mid sea level. Because if you're high above that, you're above the waves, not exposed to waves very much. And if you're way below that, you're sort of below the, where the waves are breaking and you're not exposed to such intense energy. So it's, it's kind of on the mid-level of the shore that the waves, um, effects of the breaking waves are most intense. Also, there's a big difference based on the shape of the overall coastline. If you're in a protected bay, um, then you may not experience much waves, whereas if you're out on a headland exposed to open ocean waves, the wave energy could be much more intense. Uh, the devices that you see in this picture here from a shoreline in Massachusetts are used to measure some of the environmental stresses on the shore. Um, this one here is it's a little piece of PVC pipe that's covering a temperature sensor and this records the temperature extremes experienced in the rocky intertidal um, whereas this thing with the wiffle ball attached to the uh, um, tube by a string uh, this is a wave force dynamometer and the waves will drag on the wiffle ball and uh, there's a little sensor inside this tube that can tell how hard the waves were pulling on the ball and can tell you how intense the waves were at that point. So uh, it's with instruments like this that we're sort of able to understand where the wave intensity is strongest and we use that to interpret the patterns that we observe in the life living on these rocky shores. A third uh, environmental gradient that is of great consequence in determining what type of organisms you'll see on the shoreline is particle size. So particle size goes from really big chunks of earth like rocks and uh, boulders and bedrock, um, which are stable, they're not moved by the waves, and therefore they're good places for sessile organisms like uh, mussels, barnacles, seaweeds. Um, they can attach there and not worry about being uh, rolled over or, or buried. Um, at the opposite end of the spectrum you've got very small particles like mud and sand and those shift around with the waves a lot um, so it's not a, a good place for sessile organisms to attach but for mobile burrowing organisms it's relatively easy for them to bury and dig around in that sediment and so they can have what we call an infaunal lifestyle. They live in um, and under the surface of the sediment. Um, at, in between those two extremes, 
where the particles are um, too big to sort of push aside if you're a burrower and yet too small to be stable against the action of the waves. Um, it's harder for both the infauna and the sessile epifauna to live and you tend to not have very much life on those shorelines that are made up of mid-sized particles like gravel and cobbles. Okay, so we talked about the physical gradients that, like exposure gradient, the wave energy gradient, and the particle size gradient that uh, we observe in intertidal zones. And now let's talk about the patterns of life that result in response to those gradients. The patterns in life we call biotic zonation. So it's um, these distinct, distinctly different groupings of species in different parts of the environment. So in a, here we've got an example of an environmental gradient. Maybe this is an exposure gradient or a temperature gradient. Um, and in different uh, zones of different conditions, or you have uh, different sets of, uh, of organisms. So this idea of biotic zonation is closely related to another concept from ecology called the, the ecological niche concept. So an ecological niche is the range of environmental conditions in which an organism can survive and grow. And you can define the niche based on one or more uh, types of abiotic conditions. So for simplicity here, we're defining the environmental niche of a species based only on the temperature gradient. In reality, there's probably other gradients like soil type and uh, precipitation level and things that are probably also important. Um, but let's just keep it simple and focus on the temperature gradient. So this species is a tree, a fir tree. Uh, fir trees are adapted to cool weather conditions and they can tolerate moderately warm weather um, and, and fairly cold, cool weather, but they're sort of like an optimum for their growth and survival, which is at uh, a fairly cool range of conditions. Now let's look at another tree, a pine tree. Um, so at least sometimes the pine trees are adapted to warmer conditions and they grow best in fairly hot uh, conditions. Uh, they can tolerate hotter conditions. They can grow in cooler conditions, but really the hot weather is their optimal. Um, and that's uh, what's represented on the y-axis here, the survival and growth of the organism. So you could sort of uh, measure the growth rate of the organism or its survival properties in relation to temperature, and you'd find that this range was the optimal for the pine tree. Now, if you overlay the uh, niches of both of these species, the cold-loving fir trees and the warm-loving pine trees, you could see that there's a lot of overlap in their uh, potential range of where they could live. So the potential range of environmental conditions in which the species can survive and grow is called its fundamental niche. Uh, and the fundamental niches of these two species overlap a lot. Uh, so the, the fundamental niche is kind of like under ideal conditions, could that species survive at all there? Um, reality is a little bit different. Uh, in reality, competition narrows the niches of species to restrict them to a smaller range of environmental conditions than their maximum potential that they could possibly live in. And the thing that restricts their ranges is competition with other species. So um, even though the fir tree could survive in th this range of conditions, it doesn't perform nearly as well in this range of conditions as the pine tree does. So the pine tree will be the dominant competitor in this range. Likewise, even though the pine tree might be able to survive in this range, the fir tree does much better. So the fir trees will outcompete the pine trees. And this sort of um, narrows the uh, realized niches of species relative to their fundamental niches. So let's get back to the ocean and apply this fundamental niche, realized niche concept to the ocean. The example that we'll use for this is from Joseph Connell's uh, inter Rocky intertidal research from the 1960s. So Connell was studying two species of barnacles, Cathalamus and Balanus, um, both found on the Rocky intertidal, but Balanus, Connell always seemed to find lower on the shore and uh, Cathalamus only on the higher shore. Um, and 
Connell theorized that the reason Cathalamus were only on the higher shore was that even though they could potentially survive lower down on the shore, their, their fundamental niche was lower down on the shore, um, they could not compete for space against the Balanus barnacles, and so um, that restricted their range um, to only this um, upper intertidal zone where they did not have competition from Balanus because Balanus could not survive the uh, desiccation stress of that zone. Um, so that's cool, but something I'd like you to think about with this particular example and also in general when any, when myself or any of your professors tells you something is the way it is, ask how do they know that? Uh, how, how did Connell figure out that the fundamental niche of Cathalamus was actually pretty broad and that it was narrowed only by competition. Well, uh, he f discovered this uh, through experimentation. And the experiment that he did was he used a paint scraper to remove balanus barnacles from the lower intertidal rocks. And he went out regularly, and whenever he saw balanus there, he would remove them. And he found out that if he always removed the balanus barnacles so that they wouldn't outcompete, then the Cathalamus barnacles would actually populate the not just the upper but also the lower intertidal. And that's how he realized that it was the um, uh, competition with um, balanus that was keeping Cathalamus out of the lower intertidal zone. Uh, removing Cathalamus from the upper intertidal zone did not allow balanus to occupy the upper intertidal zone because it was uh, the physical conditions that were the limiting factor for how high up on the shore Balanus could live. So here I think the moral of the story is that both competition with other species and um, the stresses of the physical environment can be limiting factors for where a species is found. Another really important insight that we got from research in rocky intertidal environments came from studies of sea stars in the Pacific Northwest, in Washington State. So um, in Washington State, one of the most obvious organisms of the rocky intertidal environment is this mussel, Middleus californianus. So they're a dominant space occupier, meaning that they take over the entire space and exclude the other similarly sized organisms um, from most of the intertidal zone. So it's really mussel dominated. Um, but that's only down from the upper intertidal down to a certain level. Once you get to um, a certain level, then um, the muscles disappear. And what was discovered by Robert Payne was that the lower range limit for the muscles was set by the upper range limit for the predators of the muscles, the starfish Pisaster ocratius. So Pisaster ocratius couldn't tolerate drying out, so it wouldn't dare venture too high on the shore. But where it could access, it would eat all the mussels. And because the mussels were eaten from the lower shoreline, that meant that other organisms like these green anemones, um, there's some sponges on the shoreline here, there's also uh, these kelps that are growing. Um, there were a lot of organisms that were excluded by the mussels from the upper shoreline, but that could live on the lower shoreline because the sea star cleared the way. So um, there's actually a higher diversity of organisms in the lower intertidal zone where the mussel, where the starfishes clear out the mussels. Um, and so the sea stars uh, were, it was realized that they were actually increasing diversity by getting rid of the mussels which were competitively dominant and excluding all the other species. And so these sea stars were found to be really, really valuable in terms of their ability to enhance biodiversity and increase the number and variety of species in the environment. And so even though the sea stars weren't super abundant, um, they were dis had a disproportionately strong effect on structuring the whole biological community. Um, and Payne decided to call them keystone species or keystone predators. So the reason that Payne called the sea stars keystone species was because of an analogy to this stone in the top of a stone arch, which is called the keystone. 
and the keystone is just one stone of the many stones in the arch but it sort of takes the pressure from all the other stones and holds the entire arch together prevents it from collapsing so it's it's only one stone but it's super duper important for keeping the whole ecosystem from or arch from collapsing and uh, if you removed it everything else would fall apart and you'd be left with a uh, just less interesting pile of rocks um, so that's the idea of what happens um, when you remove the sea star from the system uh, the muscles take over and um, you lose that diversity uh, and the reason the, the way that Payne found that out was he actually went out to the rocks picked the sea stars off of certain areas of the lower intertidal zone and threw them as far away as he could and because sea stars are so slow um, it took them weeks to crawl back um, and so consistently doing this uh, day after day uh, Payne found that the areas where he picked the mus the starfishes off the rocks eventually got populated by mussels and the mussels excluded all the other life from those areas so it was definitely the sea stars and not some environmental factor that was um, restricting the mussels from living in the lower intertidal zone let's synthesize put together what we've uh, learned from the studies of Joseph Connell and Robert Payne about ecology in general so based on their experiments in the rocky intertidal zone um, we've learned that physical stresses tend to be what sets the upper intertidal range limit of a particular species so how far up a particular species can live on the shore is usually determined by its tolerance to environmental stress an example would be the balanus barnacles which were dominant lower on the shoreline in Connell's study but which could not survive in the high intertidal because they just could not tolerate drying out and then for the question of well what prevents a species from living further down in the intertidal zone what sets its lower range limit the implication is that what sets that lower limit is biological interactions like competition or predation so competition seems to be what sets the lower limit for the thalamus barnacles which cannot compete with the balanus barnacles in the areas where balanus barnacles can be found and what sets the lower limit for mussels in the Pacific Northwest is predation by the sea stars where the sea stars are present the mussels um, cannot survive and then the third paradigm is the idea that biodiversity the overall variety of life is maintained by keystone species predators like the Pisaster sea star that eat away the otherwise dominant uh, space occupiers like mussels and allow space for a variety of other life forms to live so all of these paradigms that arose from the early works of Connell and Payne have some ap applicability they, we still teach about them because they're at least partially true but more recent studies have added to these theories and found exceptions and um, complications as typically happens with science one of the complications and additions to the early theories of rocky intertidal ecology um, was a modification of Payne's keystone species concept and what brought about that modification was a recognition that diversity on the rocky intertidal shore is not just diversity of the obvious organisms what we call primary space occupiers like mussels and anemones and kelp big organisms that are easy to see but a lot of the diversity is actually small species that live on under or in between the dominant space occupiers small things like snails amphipods and worms that might not be included in uh, a cursory survey of biodiversity uh, and if you include those secondary space occupiers the idea of um, what uh, sort of maximizes diversity might be a little bit different so now instead of thinking of mussels as the bad guys that are excluding all the other species we now see mussels as facilitators um, which by protecting from drying out can provide sort of a, a hidden habitat for these small little organisms that live in between and on the mussels so 
um, habitat forming species, which is one of the terms for mussels and corals and seagrasses, any kind of species that form a habitat with their bodies, um, can actually increase total diversity even if they're sort of excluding other dominant space occupiers. So in this picture here, we can see that sort of line on the intertidal where you get to the point that's the highest on the shore that the Pisces or sea stars can access. And below that point, there are no mussels because the sea stars ate them all. And there's quite a variety of other life. You can see several species of seaweed here, obviously. Uh, as you go higher on the shore, you pretty much just see the mussels. Um, but in and among the mussels, there are many small little critters, secondary space occupiers like amphipods, worms, barnacles that are living on top of the mussels. And, and if you look at those diverse, those secondary space occupiers, they actually have a high diversity in the mussel dominated habitat. So um, which situation is better for diversity kind of depends on your perspective and whether you're evaluating the diversity of the primary space occupiers or the secondary space occupiers. On sandy and muddy shorelines, it's harder to see the zones of, of different life. Um, and therefore, it's harder to study them. But there is zonation on sandy and muddy shores as well. And it, there's this example that I'm going to give here is from the Bay of Fundy. It's an area in uh, Canada where there's an extreme tidal range. So the difference in water level between high tide and low tide is up to 15 meters at some places, which is huge. It means that a vast area of shoreline is exposed at low tide and then covered again at high tide. So it's a really great place to study intertidal ecology as long as you keep your eye on the watch and don't drown when the tide comes in. So from these scientists who hurriedly studied the shoreline and then ran away as the tide came in, um, they have characterized zones of different life, uh, which you cannot see from the surface because it all just looks like sand and mud. Um, but down beneath the surface, yes, there are different assemblages of life at the different zones in the shoreline, as, as you might expect, um, based on the different environmental tolerances to desiccation of, of different organisms. Uh, you don't need to know the names of the organisms or all these different zones in the sandy shore. I'm just including this to give you uh, a sense that, yes, there is variation in life along the exposure gradient on sandy and muddy shores as well as on rocky shores. So. Um, the gradients are not as sharp and obvious on sandy and muddy beaches, though, and some of the reasons that the things are a little fuzzier on sandy and muddy beaches compared to those like very obvious sharp patterns on rocky beaches uh, are included here. So one of those reasons is that space is probably not such a limiting factor. It's a more three-dimensional environment that can be burrowed through. So there's not quite that life or death competition for space among things like barnacles and mussels and seaweeds. Um, uh, and maybe another reason is that uh, whereas on the rocky shore, Things that are living on the surface of the rock are directly exposed to predators and can be completely eaten if there's a lot of predators in the area. Because there's sort of that hiding place of burrowing down into the sand and mud, you don't have that super strong structuring of life by predators in the sandy shore that you do in the rocky shore. Um, and uh, that's not to say that there isn't some strong predation on sandy and muddy shores. And one of the predators that's uh, common on sandy and muddy shores is, well, it's more than one species, but there, there are many species of sea, or shorebirds uh, which are adapted to feeding in these environments. This picture shows some examples of shorebirds from an area in Australia where you can see how the great variety of beak shapes of these shorebirds allows them to feed on different infaunal organisms uh, and epifaunal organisms on the sandy and muddy shores. Um, okay. All right, so we've talked about competition, predation, and physical stresses and how those determine uh, what organisms will be found at what points on a shoreline. And now I want to talk about another thing that's maybe a little less intuitive, but that also has a huge effect on what species will be found along a particular shoreline. 
and this factor it, when we study this factor we call that supply side ecology uh, and the factor is um, the supply of larvae to that habitat so the organisms that are living on the shoreline particularly on rocky shorelines are mostly sessile organisms which are stuck to the rock and do not move as adults but um, they do have a mobile life stage as larvae. The eggs develop into small larvae and the larvae develop in the plankton for some period of time before hopefully drifting back to shore where they're settled onto the rock, glue themselves in place and stay there for the rest of their lives. Um, but there's, there's a whole lot that can happen while those organisms are drifting out in the ocean. And so sometimes lots and lots of larvae come and sprinkle themselves back onto the rocks after their time in the ocean, whereas other times, not so much. Uh, and some of the factors in the ocean that can affect uh, the supply of larvae are uh, disper their dispersion and survival, so where the currents take them, and also what the conditions are like in the planktonic community of the ocean. Do they have microscopic algae to feed on or do they have predators that are eating them? Or is the temperature and salinity right? Um, all those things have to um, work out for the organisms and then the currents have to take them back to the shoreline and deposit them on the rocks somewhere. And so there's, there's a, um, a lot that can affect the supply of larvae to the shoreline and What, what, so what happens offshore doesn't stay offshore, right? Uh, so in order to understand why the species that we see on the shoreline are there, we have to not just think about how they're competing and what the predation situation is like on the shoreline, we also have to think about earlier in their life cycle and how their lar those larvae might have even arrived at that shore in the first place. An analogy that can help explain supply side ecology is uh, an analogy from um, war, where one of the ways that we humans fight each other in wars is by dropping soldiers onto the battlefield out of airplanes, uh, paratroopers. And if we can supply a lot of soldiers and weaponry to the battle, we're more likely to win the battle. Maybe even if our soldiers don't have such good guns and maybe they're not as, as competitive, if, there's, if we just overwhelm that environment with lots and lots of troops being dropped in, then we can sort of win the competition and be the ones that end up occupying that territory. Um, so it, it's kind of like that uh, on the rocky shores. Uh, the species that we see there may not necessarily even be the best competitors, but they're the species that arrived in greatest numbers and that's why we see them there today. So this aerial photo shows a color-coded image of the ocean where there's different colors that indicate different amounts of uh, chlorophyll in the water. Chlorophyll is an indicator of how much algae there is in the water, which is affected by the amount of nutrients that are available and other factors. Um, and uh, the, the currents along the shoreline, particularly along the coast of California here where there's strong currents that called upwelling that bring nutrients from deep waters to the surface, they can have a huge effect on how suitable the coastal ocean environment is for the growth and survival of larvae and can also have an impact on whether or not those larvae that develop in the coastal ocean are then brought back to the shoreline where they can settle and live as adults. So um, these uh, complicated swirls of productivity and currents in the, along the coastline are hugely consequential for determining what types of life will end up uh, being supplied to the rocky shores. So I want to finish this lecture with kind of a personal story of some research that I did in the rocky intertidal of New England. Uh, I think the rocky intertidal rocks, and here I am posing with a, a metal detector that I use to find uh, bolts where I've labeled plots in the rocky intertidal. Um, uh, it's, it's hard to find the same spot in the rocky intertidal again when you come back after weeks because seaweed can cover up any labels or um, stuff that you put on the rocks and so the metal detector helps me find the metal things that label my study sites on the rocks uh, so here I'm pretending that it's a guitar uh, all right so what I was doing up there besides um, posing like a musician 
was studying diversity of seaweeds and how that affected the overall productivity in terms of seaweed growth and um, animal productivity of the of the rocky intertidal environment. So the, the main question behind the research that I was involved in there with other scientists, the lead scientist on this project was uh, Matthew Bracken. Um, uh, the main question that motivated our research was how does seaweed diversity and species composition uh, affect intertidal ecosystem functioning at different spatial scales in different climates? Basically, uh, that translates into um, do different types of seaweeds and different numbers of types of seaweeds change how these ecosystems work? And is that affected by climate? Like. Uh, do these shoreline communities in Massachusetts, which is relatively warm, differ from those in Maine where it's freezing all the time? So this was a manipulative experiment, meaning that we didn't just go out and survey what was on the shoreline. We actually uh, removed species selectively from these uh, 50 centimeter round areas of the shoreline in order to see sort of what would happen with uh, a limited number of species versus the full number of seaweed species that um, can be found in this environment. So uh, we, we first marked the plots with a stainless steel bolt that we drilled into the rock um, and that would be the center of this sort of uh, defined circular area that we um, defined with this hula hoop built thing um, called a round rat and originally all of the shoreline there had uh, multiple species of seaweed on it, uh, three or more species, Ascophyllum fucus and Mastocarpus. Ascophyllum and fucus are brown algae, and this Mastocarpus was a red algae. And um, so what we did was we took paint, paint scrapers and we created monocultures. So monocultures means just one species is present. So instead of having all the types of seaweed, we wanted to see what would happen if we only allowed one type of seaweed to grow by removing all the other types of seaweed. Um, so we did this once and then we had to do this on a regular basis because seaweed grows back. And, and so it actually it was really, really painstaking. It took a lot of labor uh, for a long period of time to keep these monocultures pure uh, like they were supposed to be. Um, and then you know they, they gradually filled in uh, with a higher density of that one species uh, as the competitors were removed. Uh, in addition to the monocultures, we had polyculture treatments where we did allow uh, multiple species to coexist. Uh, one of the things that ecologists, not only in the rocky intertidal, but in all kind of ecosystems are um, uh, interested in is what are the effects of diversity? What are the benefits of having multiple species? Um, we this is an important question because we sort of wonder like is it worth the effort to preserve the variety of life and and prevent species from going extinct or or is one species good enough and we don't really need to worry about protecting a whole variety of life um, that's one of the reasons that we do these experiments that compare a small number of species to a large number of species all right so we needed control treatments where we had the full number of species. So we had some where we didn't uh, change anything. We just put the bolt in the rock and left all the seaweeds like they were. Um, but we had some others that we thinned out a little bit because when we were creating the monocultures, we had to remove um, uh, some of the biomass of seaweed and that could have an effect. And so if we wanted to make it a fair comparison, uh, we would have to remove some biomass from the uh, poly, from some of the multi-species treatments as well. Uh, and we did the same kind of experiment in uh, three different parts of the coastline, Northern Maine, Central Maine, and Nahant, which is in Boston Harbor. Um, and we did this over this large geographic range because the climate varies from northern Maine to Massachusetts and there's a lot more heat stress in Massachusetts where the summer weather is hot than in northern Maine where the summer weather is cool and foggy. Uh, in addition to differences in heat there were different amounts of sessile invertebrates like mussels and barnacles. Um, there were a lot more of them in uh, that would rec recruit to the rocks because in Massachusetts than in northern Maine because the supply side ecology was different and lots of barnacle and mussel larvae would end up um, drifting in to this area and settling on the rocks there. 
And so the competition between seaweeds and barnacles and mussels also affected things a lot uh, more in this area than up here. So um, we're sort of wondering uh, what the effects of seaweed diversity would be in these different areas and how they might depend on these differences in uh, physical conditions and the amount of uh, competition from mussels and barnacles. So um, the, I, I should say the results that we found uh, uh, before I um, go into this pic picture show and tell, basically we found that um, the effects of diversity, uh, the variety of seaweed species was especially important where the environment was more stressful. Um, so in Massachusetts, having the full complement of species, three species, sea, seaweed species, was really important to maintaining the overall amount of seaweed. Whereas uh, up in northern Maine, um, the seaweeds didn't need to, uh, were, um, didn't need any help to be really productive because it was such a benign environment where it was cool and misty all the time. Uh, anyway, so this is a picture of uh, Lubeck, Maine, our northernmost study site. This is actually the furthest north and east you can go and still be in the United States of America. And this is the spot, if you're standing at this lighthouse, where you get to see the sunrise first uh, of uh, all of America uh, if you're there. So um, because it's so far east. So uh, if you ever get a chance to go there, it's pretty desolate and, and beautiful and cold. Make sure you bring plenty of warm clothes even in the summertime. Uh, and uh, you might not want to go there in the winter time. It was so cold there that uh, there would be this sort of like ice mist that would rise off the water and it would form these ice mist um, water spouts or like mini tornadoes uh, as the water which was very cold uh, met the air which was even colder. Um, so it, this was beautiful but of course uh, you know my fingers were numb as I took this picture. Uh, and it was so cold that even the salt water uh, in the rocky intertidal was freezing. And you can see these uh, icicles forming on the seaweeds of the rocky shore there. Um, and, you know, we, we tried to work as fast as we could because we were always racing the incoming tide and also um, hoping to get out of the cold as, as quick as we could. Um, and so the suffering was worth it though because we got to see this beautiful ecosystem and participate in a uh, science project that helped us understand the role of biodiversity and the importance of biodiversity. So I would say my, my final little piece for you all is uh, don't turn down the opportunity to do a challenging science study in a difficult environment uh, where the weather is really cold or hot or buggy because uh, you know if it was easy someone would have done it already and um, you might have a chance to see some aspects of mother nature that most people don't get to see all right that's it